Hello, comrades, and welcome to today's Omali Taught Me Sunday Study featuring Chairman Amalia Shatella. My name is Akile Anai, the Director of Agitation and Propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party, as well as your MC for this morning. Make sure to hit that like button and share this video on the platform that you're viewing from. This week, Chairman Amalia Shatella continues a study on dialectical materialism. He will read from Materialism and the Dialectical Method by Maurice Cornforth, starting on page 26 with the subhead, The Fight for Materialism. The study materials have been linked in the Facebook and YouTube descriptions for your benefit. For the first hour, the chairman will review the study materials, and in the second hour, we'll open it up to you, our live viewers, to ask your questions. It's my honor now to introduce our leadership, the leader of the African nation and the worldwide African revolution, Chairman Amalia Shatella. Uhuru, Chairman. Uhuru, uh, thank you so much, uh, Comment Director Akila. And before we get started, I would really like to congratulate you again on the extraordinary Brownsville newspaper. I just uh, got access to the December 2021 issue of the Brownsville newspaper. It's a remarkable journal. Um, and I love it uh, all the time, but uh, this is 53 years of, in print, and which means that uh, the Brunswick newspaper predates the founding of the African People's Socialist Party. And it actually, it was uh, an instrument that uh, helped to identify uh, Africans uh, from various places around the country and the world uh, to, uh, uh, to begin defining and fighting for uh, the party, what the party should look like what the party should be. So it's extraordinary. And I just wanted to let everybody to know that the December uh, issue, uh, 2021, Burning Spear is now available. And uh, I'm sure that you'll let people know how they can get it. So I just wanted to, to uh, acknowledge it. It's a great sphere and uh, I love it. And uh, I'm, I'm also appreciative, Carmen Akila. I mentioned uh, this to you earlier. And uh, uh, um, I think it's on page, uh, Four, uh, the the their briefs, uh, short pieces, and uh, and of course uh, we're talking about uh, cultural workers and and on this page of uh, the Askia Toure, uh, there's an article Askia Toure and remarkable, uh, uh, incredible uh, revolutionary. It says poet. He is a, a revolutionary cultural worker. He's that uh, and. Um, and to not to uh, understate the significance of that, uh, but he uh, is much more. And his, uh, he's made his mark, uh, continues to make his mark as, uh, in the struggle of our people. And, and I see that he has joined the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement in Kida. So uh, thank you, uh, Kamel Akile, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for the Burning Spear newspaper. And I want to just uh, uh, welcome everybody. And we want to begin this process of looking at uh, dialectical and historical materialism. The reason we're talking about uh, dialect dialectical materialism, and uh, it's something that uh, some people uh, may uh, find uh, uh, unnecessary or, or uh, not be able to understand the significance of dialectical materialism or the investigation into the whole question of philosophy. Uh, because uh, philosophy uh, is something that has been uh, uh, extracted uh, from and uh, from ordinary life of the people as a as a phenomenon it has uh, been something that has ab been abstracted and uh, held to be uh, this uh, very uh, special thing that only uh, uh, the most uh, educated and and erudite and uh, you know, middle class petty bourgeois forces would be interested in, uh, when the fact of the matter is that uh, philosophy is, is 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 actually you know the, the most generalized assumption of uh, a place and destiny in the world, and everybody it's our worldview, and everybody has a worldview, and the worldview is an extraordinarily important thing. But people are not necessarily walking around saying I have a worldview. It, people just have that based in the kinds of societies we've been born into and live with the experiences that we have in the world uh, that, that uh, is informed also by uh, the nature of the society that we live in. But if you live in a world where, uh, <clears throat> where others have come and attacked your society and 
as a means of controlling uh, and and uh, uh, controlling us, which is what colonialism is all about. Uh, they one of the major assaults they make on the people uh, is on their belief system, so that. Uh, you no longer have access uh, to a belief system that, uh, that sprang from uh, your requirements uh, uh, and in terms of developing the society that you live in. Now, uh, a foreign and alien entity has attacked uh, 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 the community. That's what colonialism is and has imposed upon the people a, a, a different worldview that makes us vulnerable and susceptible to our oppression. And so that's why this issue of, 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 of philosophy is really important. Uh, but what we want to do is to dethrone it. We want to take it up uh, from, from, the, from this place, uh, this rare, rarefied place that the philosophers, the, uh, the petty bourgeoisie, the, the uh, middle class intellectuals have thrust it uh, so that it's beyond the, the, the reaches of the people. And uh, which makes the people always vulnerable and, and susceptible to somebody else's definition of our reality. So we want to. <clears throat> part of what we are about as revolutionaries uh, is to uh, give the African working class access to uh, its own ability to access uh, the world, uh, to to define uh, the world, and to to analyze this world as we investigate it. And that's all uh, this is about. When we talk about dialectical materialism, uh, it's a worldview. It's a method by which we investigate the world to uh, come to certain kinds of conclusions that shape our, our worldview. And, and it's important. Uh, so I, wanna, I, I just wanted to make that observation uh, before going uh, into uh, the actual um, reading. And I want to say that I'm, I'm going to try to read faster than I usually do. Uh, because I'm, I want to leave much of what has to be done up to you. You really have to, to uh, we, you have access to this document. And of course, as you know, uh, this document is something that we use <coughs> primarily uh, for structures. <coughs> and it, uh, it gives us, uh, 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 you know, like a, a, a structure within which we uh, make this discussion around uh, dialectic materialism. Maurice Cornforth did a good job on that. We disagree with Cornforth in terms of many of the conclusions he's come to. Uh, we disagree with the whole assumption that the Marxists are the, the organized vanguard of the working class uh, to end all exploitation, et cetera, et cetera, as, as, uh, as this new uh, the place we're going to begin uh, 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 speaks of uh, 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 by Cornforth. Uh, um, we think that what's really important that Marx did in this Marxist he's talking about is Karl Marx, the, uh, the one who uh, is noted for being the author of the, uh, of the uh, book Das Kapital uh, the, and, and uh, probably the most uh, spoken of uh, book, most uh, probably second to the Bible and probably read uh, by people who speak about it as much as the Bible has been read by people who speak about it, which is to say not that much. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, it was a very important document, very important book. Uh, and he is one along with um, uh, Engels, who, uh, Frederick Engels, who worked with him, uh, uh, who uh, has been most responsible for articulating and consolidating uh, what we come to know as dialectic materialism uh, subsequent to uh, the uh, 19th century. So I'm hoping that you'll take a look at this and I'm hoping that you have access to uh, the, uh, the uh, past discussions we've had uh, on this too, so that you can examine them because in many ways, many times we deconstruct uh, some of the things that Marx and, and Cornforth have said uh, and uh, trying to show how utilization of uh, the method of investigation and analysis that characterize as dialectical materialism uh, that this study is about, that utilization of this methods of investigation and analysis were actually have us come to different conclusions that Marx and Cornforth have come to. Uh, so, but I'm going to begin this and I'm going to also suggest to you that you read uh, the political report, uh, reports that, uh, that I've made uh, 
to every Congress we've done, but especially the ones from our sixth and seventh Congress, their last two. But all of them, uh, what you will find is uh, um, uh, express uh, historical materialist, dialectical materialism uh, as it's applied to an investigation of human society. You will see that 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 uh, they uh, they are all uh, expressions of uh, dialectical materialism. So please take a look at them as well. So, and I'm explaining why I'm going to try to be much. Uh, 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 to read this much more quickly than traditionally. So hopefully I can cover more uh, of this uh, on the way out. So again, uh, we're on page 26, the fight for Marxism. A Marxist, uh, as the organized vanguard of the working class fighting to end all exploitation of man by man and to establish communism have no use for idealism in any form. Here, for example, are some of the ways in which Lenin expressed himself on this question. Here's a quote by Lenin. The genius of Marx and Engels consisted in the very fact that in the course of a long period, nearly half a century, they developed materialism, that they further advanced one fundamental trend in philosophy. Take the various philosophical utterances by Marx, and you will find an invariable basis, basic motif, viz. Uh, insistence upon materialism and contemptuous derision of all obscurantism, of all confusion, and all deviations toward idealism. Marx and Engels were partisans in philosophy from start to finish. They were able to detect the deviations from materialism and concessions to idealism in each and every so-called new tendency. The realist, et cetera, <clears throat> including the positivists, are all a wretched mush. They, they are a contemptible middle party in philosophy who confuse the imperialist and idealist trends on every question. The attempt to escape these two basic trends in philosophy is nothing but conciliatory quackery, unquote. <clears throat> so on every issue, we are partisans of materialism against idealism. We are partisans of materialism against idealism. This is because that it is in the light of materialist theory, which studies things as they are without idealist fantasies about them, that we can understand the forces in nature and society so as to be able to transform society and to master the forces of nature. <laughs> and because of this too, materialism teaches us to have confidence in ourselves in the working class, in people. Materialism teaches us to have confidence in ourselves in the working class, in people. It teaches us that there are no mysteries beyond our understanding that we need not accept that which is as being the will of God, that we should contemptuously reject the authoritative teachings of those who set up to be our masters and that we can ourselves understand nature and society so as to be able to change them. We hate idealism. Because under cover of high sounding talk, it preaches the subjection of man to man and delivers the power of humanity. It was the materialist confidence in humanity which, expressed, which was expressed by Maxim Gorky when he wrote, quote, for me, there, is, there are no ideas beyond man. For me, man and only man is the miracle worker and the future master of all forces of nature. The most beautiful thing in this our world are the things made by labor, made by skilled human hands. And all our ideas are born out of the process of labor. And if it is thought necessary to speak of sacred things, then the one sacred thing in the, is the dissatisfaction of man with himself and his striving to be better than he is. Sacred is his hatred of all the trivial rubbish which he himself has created. Sacred is his desire to do away with greed, envy, crime, disease, war, and all enmity between men on earth, <clears throat> and sacred is his labor, unquote. So we're looking at mechanistic materialism, the type of materialism produced in the past by the revolutionary bourgeoisie was mechanistic, mechanistic materialism. And the bourgeoisie is characterized as revolutionaries. You know, uh, uh, people who are conscious of, of struggling uh, against capitalism, 
uh, frequently uh, uh, speak of struggling against the bourgeoisie. So how can the bourgeoisie be revolutionary if that's what we've been struggling against? But the bourgeoisie is characterized as revolutionary uh, by Marxists and uh, uh, in the struggle in, in this instance, because the bourgeoisie replaced uh, uh, another a ruling elite uh, during, uh, 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 because of the, the, the collapse of feudalism. Feudalism was the primary mode of production uh, that was replaced by capitalism in Europe uh, as it was uh, understood. And uh, so the, according to the Marxist logic, then the bourgeoisie is revolutionary because it uh, facilitated the overthrow of the feudal, feudalist landlords and, and uh, nobility. So uh, the type of materialism produced in the past by the revolutionary bourgeoisie was mechanistic materialism. This took over the ancient materialist conceptions that the world consisted of unchanging material particles, atoms, whose interactions produce all the phenomena of nature and, and further strove to understand the workings of nature on the model of the workings of a machine. It was in its time uh, a progressive and revolutionary doctrine, uh, but it had three great weaknesses. And the reason they were characterized as revolutionary in its time is because uh, it uh, at least uh, recognized uh, uh, the, the significance of nature and, 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 uh, and the world and did not presuppose that everything uh, was based on, uh, uh, on gods and, and things like this. And so, or, or, uh, or it, it challenged the hegemony of, uh, of religion and, and superstition, it challenged that. It was not a complete overthrow of that as we will see. It was in its time a progressive and revolutionary doctrine, but it has three great weaknesses. One, uh, it requires the conception of a supreme being who started the world up. It seeks to reduce all processes to the same cycle of mechanistic interactions, and so cannot account for development, for the emergence of new qualities, new types of processes in nature. And three, it cannot account for social development, can give no account of human social activity and leads to an abstract conception of human nature, the changing world and how to understand. Before Marx, materialism was predominantly me mechanistic. We often hear people complain about the materialists, uh, that the materialists seek to reduce everything in the world, including life and mind to a system of soulless mechanism, to a mere mechanical interaction of bodies. This refers to mechanistic materialism. Marxist materialism is, however, not mechanistic, but dialectical. To understand what this means, we need first to understand something about mechanistic materialism itself. We can approach this problem by asking how materialists have sought to understand the various processes of change which are observed everywhere in the world. The world is full of change. Night follows day and day night. Uh, the seasons succeed each other. People are born, grow old, and die. Every philosophy recognizes that change is an omnipresent fact. The question is, how are we to understand the change which we observe everywhere? Change can be understood in the first place in an idealist way or in a materialist way. Idealism traces back all change to some, kind, some idea or intention. If not human, then divine. Thus for idealism, change in the material world are in the last analysis initiated and brought about by something outside matter, not material, not subject to the laws of the material world. But materialism traces back all changes to material causes. In other words, it seeks to explain what happens in the material world from the material world itself. But while the occurrence of change has been recognized by everyone since none can ignore it, philosophers have nevertheless sought to find something which does not change something permanent, something changeless, behind or within the change. This is generally an essential part of the ideology of an exploiting class. They are afraid of change because they are afraid that they too may be swept away. So they always seek for something fixed and stable, not subject to change. They try to hitch themselves onto this as it were. The early materialists too sought for this. Behind all the changing appearances, they look for something which never changes. But while idealists look for the eternal and changeless in the realm of spirit, spirit, these materialists look for it in the material world itself. And they found it 
in the ultimate material particle, the eternal and indestructible atom. Atom is a Greek word meaning unbreakable. For such a materialist, then all changes were produced by the movement and interaction of unchanging atoms. This is a very ancient theory put forward over 2000 years ago in Greece and earlier still in India. In his day, it was a very progressive theory, a very a great weapon against idealism and superstition. The Roman poet Lucretius, for example, explained in his philosophical poem on the nature of things that the purpose of the animistic theory of the Greek philosopher Epicurus was to demonstrate what are the elements out of which everything is formed and how everything comes to pass without the intervention of the gods. Thus, there was born a materialism which saw the world as consisting of hard, impenetrable material particles and which understood all things as arising from nothing but the motion and interaction of such particles. This theory was revived in modern times in the 16th and 17th century. centuries. Philosophers and scientists turned to it in their fight against feudal Catholic philosophy. But this modern materialism proved to be much richer in content than the ancient, or it tried to work out what were the laws of interaction of material particles, and so to present a picture of how all phenomena, from merely physical change, changes to the life of man, resulted from the motion and interaction of the separate parts of matter. In this way, by the 18th century, there, there had appeared the characteristic modern theories of mechanistic materialism. Mechanism, mechanistic materialism was in essence an ideology, a mode of theorizing of the rising bourgeoisie, rising in the struggle against feudalism and the, in, in the feudal order. In order to understand it, we must understand, first of all, that it arose and developed in opposition to feudal ideology, that its critical edge was directed against feudal ideas, that it was in fact the most radical of all bourgeois forms of opposition against the feudal outlook. In the period of the rise of the bourgeoisie, the feudal social relations were shattered, and so were the feudal ideas embodied in the Catholic philosophy in which those social relations were enshrined. The feudal system whose economic basis lay in the exploitation of the serfs by the feudal proprietors involved complex social relationships of, a, of dependence, subordination, and allegiance. All this was reflected not only in social and political philosophy, but also in the philosophy of nature. <clears throat> it was typical of the, <clears throat> of the natural philosophy of the feudal period that everything in nature was explained in terms of its proper place in the system of the universe in terms of its supposed position of dependence and subordination in that system and of the end of purpose which it existed uh, uh, to serve. Uh, the bourgeois philosophers and scientists destroyed these feudal ideas about nature. They regarded nature as a system of bodies and in interaction and rejecting all the feudal dogmas they call for the investigation of nature in order to discover how nature really worked. The investigation of nature advanced hand in hand with the geographical discoveries. Here we are. The development of trade and transport, the improvement of machinery and manufacturers. The greatest strides were made in the mechanical sciences, closely connected as they were to the needs of technology. So it came about that materialist theory was enriched as part of the scientific investigation of nature and in particular by the mechanical sciences. Uh, yeah, I'm tempted to leave this and, and you know, just you know, say a little bit. They're talking about the investigation of nature advanced hand in hand with geographical discoveries. What the hell is that? The development of trade and transport. What are they talking about? The, the improvement of machinery and, and manufacturers. Uh, uh, and when you're talking about geographical, what they characterize discoveries, of course, is uh, the Americas, uh, Africa, and all these other places that, and, and, and it, if we understand this, it helps us to understand that uh, what they are talking about is development of, of uh, philosophy affecting uh, a struggle against feudal dogma, uh, uh, that it was uh, influenced by uh, what, uh, what uh, the connections with uh, other peoples and lands and territories and countries that uh, shattered and challenged this uh, basic uh, 
European uh, worldview that was limited uh, and in many ways in terms of philosophy uh, uh, and, and development uh, are much are further behind uh, other places that came under assault by Europe. So it came about that materialist theory was enshrined, was enriched <clears throat> as the result of scientific investigation of nature and in particular by me mechanical sciences. So it, they're talking about the development of materialist theory uh, and, and specifically in Europe. So this determined at once the strength and the weaknesses of the achievement and the limitations of materialist theory. What pushed that theory forward was, so Engels writes, quote, <clears throat> the powerful and ever more rapidly in unrushing progress of science and industry. But it remained predominantly mechanical. <laughs> because only the mechanical sciences had attained any high degree of development. It's, it's a specific, but at that time inevitable limitation was its exclusive application of the standards of mechanics. The mechanistic way of understanding nature did not arise, however, simply from the fact that at that time it was the only, uh, it was only the mechanical sciences which had made any great progress. It was, deeply rooted in the class outlook of the most progressive bourgeois philosophers. And this led to their turning ex exclusively, exclusively to the mechanical sciences for their inspirations. Um, just as the bourgeoisie overthrowing feudal society stood for individual liberty, equality, and the development of a free market, so the most uh, progressive philosophers of the bourgeoisie, the materialists uh, overthrowing the feudal ideas proclaimed that the world consisted of separate material particles interacting with one another in accordance with the laws of mechanics. <clears throat> this theory of nature reflected bourgeois social relations no less than the theories it replaced have reflected feudal social relations. But just as the new bourgeois uh, social relations broke the feudal fetters and enabled a new development of the forces of production to begin, so the corresponding bourgeois theory of nature broke down the barriers which feudal ideas had placed in the way of scientific research and enable a new, a great new development of scientific research to begin. The philosophical outlook seemed to find its confirmation in science and science provided materials for the development and working out in detail of the philosophical outlook. There, there's so much in this that that we could talk about uh, and in this that helps us to uh, see that, um, that the, the very uh, uh, thing that Cornforth and Marx would be criticizing in terms of the limitations of feudal society can be seen uh, in the limitations of the society that it, it presumed to replace. And that is what it would characterize as the capitalist society. Because a profound thing that is happening and changing uh, and should change the nature of how all of this is viewed uh, as something that, uh, that Marx missed, uh, something that Cornforth misses, is that the world changed in a profound way uh, with the advent of the colonialism, uh, where we pass here about how changes uh, were made uh, uh, to how people understood the world through trade and uh, 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 and 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 uh, things like that, uh, and 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 travel. Uh, the the reality is, this is trade and travel that resolved, revolved around uh, uh, the uh, assault on Africa, the uh, the uh, the economic uh, the contours of the entire globe uh, 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 was changed. The assault on Africa, the the. Uh, uh, development of what Marx characterized as the uh, uh, primitive accumulation of capital, the startup of capital, uh, uh, you know, which began, as Marx says, with the transformation of Africa into a, a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins, and uh, how Europe uh, made war against China to, to force China to become a nation of junkies in order to bring tremendous risks. I said Europe, this is even before there was such a thing as Europe. Europe is being formed by this process that we're talking about now. And a new uh, world economy is coming into existence now. Uh, but the thing that's happening is it's no longer a European phenomenon as such, or a phenomenon that's particular and specifically to the white people who uh, existed in the territories called Europe. I mean, these individuals uh, uh, 
and corporations uh, left Europe. They went to the territories that we now know as the Americas. They went to you know places like New Zealand, all all around the world, and they were capturing tremendous amount of wealth. Uh, and this process is what we characterize um, as a, a a new mode of production. And so that we saw uh, feudalism as a mode of production uh, that was uh, defined primarily. Uh, 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 with the, the, the dominating uh, critical forces being uh, the uh, the peasants and the and the uh, the serfs on the one hand who were being exploited uh, by uh, by the landlords uh, the the land owners the uh, the nobility on the other hand and this was a mode of production uh, where the production itself uh, was something that revolved around uh, this uh, this 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 economic relationship that I just uh, that was just described. Well, another mode of production has come into being now uh, because uh, uh, this thing that now is becoming uh, Europe uh, uh, is developing as a consequence of relationship it has with uh, Africa and Africans, uh, with the, the, the people of the Americas and what have you. Uh, so uh, what is happening is a new mode of production has come into existence. It's a colonial mode of production. And uh, it's really important for us to understand this because all the, uh, the uh, primary economic activity in the world changes. It's no longer activity that's limited to a particular uh, space uh, in this territory called Europe. Uh, in particular France or particular to, to Germany, et cetera. There's a whole new world economy and it's, it, in, in, in it's captured all of us uh, in its embrace. And then it's pun here that we have to seek laws of, uh, of development and of, so, of, of social development because the whole character and nature of society, the, well, certainly the character of the society has now changed uh, with this new economic uh, uh, process that has been born uh, that, uh, that we characterize as a colonial mode of production. So, uh, uh, and we talk here uh, with Cornforth again, let's see, this is um, on page, uh, 31, that just as the bourgeois overthrowing feudal society stood for individual liberty, equality, and the development of a free market, so the most progressive philosophers of the bourgeoisie, the materialists, uh, overthrowing uh, the feudal ideas proclaimed that the world consisted of separate material particles interacting, interacting with one another in accordance with, uh, with the laws of mechanics. And uh, this theory of nature reflected bourgeois social relations no less than the theories it replaced had reflected uh, feudal social relations. And, and, but just as the new bourgeois social relations broke the feudal fetters and enabled a new development of the forces of production to begin, so the corresponding bourgeois theory of nature broke down the barriers which feudal ideas had placed on the way of scientific research and enable a new, a great new development of scientific research to begin, and it did, uh, but it was limited, and and uh, it was uh, uh, and an understanding of this was contaminated by the inability of Marx and those who uh, uh, were colonizers by virtue of their relationship uh, to uh, this process of Europe uh, extracting and getting all of a majority of value from the colonized peoples of the world. So, you, so now you have a, a new uh, world economy that's not limited to uh, the specific uh, linguistic and territory bases that you find in this, this area that we now know uh, as, as Europe. It's a much broader, much greater uh, uh, than that. And this is where, the, the, where we have to look uh, in terms of understanding things about laws of, of social development uh, from that point on that has changed. It's no longer a white thing. It's no longer a European thing. It's no longer uh, uh, the Europe and Africa and what we now know as the Americas living as these separate entities not connected to each other except uh, uh, by the fact that Europeans come and capture people, et cetera. Uh, Europeans come and exploit the land and the people there. There's a whole new social system that has emerged and the whole existence of and, and success of, of this thing that we now, uh, that we call Europe uh, is reliant upon the uh, of, of stealing the resources, taking the resources, and undermining the success of Africans, the, the the peoples who live in what we call the Americas, now the indigenous peoples and things like that, and much of the other people around the world. We we don't have time to to belabor this much. Uh, I just wanted to 
throw this in. I didn't have an opportunity to make some notes here that to draw this out uh, more effectively and more efficiently, but I just wanted to leave that. And this is something that we can mull over because we're gonna be looking at this. You are uh, looking at this uh, uh, even uh, subsequent to this discussion that we're having now uh, uh, and, and looking at the political reports, uh, the several political reports that I've done uh, in the past, and again, placing emphasis on the last two, but they are not exclusive. Uh, it's not just these last two. Every political report that you that has been written uh, is deeply uh, uh, rooted in and gives a, a dialectical and historical materialist uh, worldview uh, for the investigation and analysis, uh, the, its outcome, their outcomes. So its outcome. So, uh, now, the philosophical outlook seemed to find this confirmation in science and science provided materials for the development and working on in detail of the philosophical outlook. And then we're talking about philosophy here. We're talking about the, 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 the emergence of a, of a, a, a mechanistic uh, materialism in Europe. And uh, the world, so thought the mechanistic materialist consists of nothing but particles of matter in interaction. Each particle has an existence separate and distinct from every other. Uh, in their totality, they form the world. The totality of the interactions form the totality of everything that happens in the world. This is how these mechanistic materials are. And these interactions are of the mechanical type. That is to say, they consist simply uh, of the external influence of, of one particle upon another. Such a theory is equivalent to regarding the whole world as nothing but a complex piece of machinery, a mechanism. Uh, uh, from this standpoint, and, 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 and this is you know, really uh, something that the Marxists uh, did, even with the creation of the, 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 uh, uh, the, this thing that they call primitive accumulation, because uh, the, the primitive accumulation that they, that they talk about does not infer a, a new relationship uh, that uh, of uh, different uh, peoples and countries and, uh, and even working people for that matter, it infers the existence of this, uh, this, this Africans and other people uh, uh, simply as these atoms that uh, impact on the development of Europe. So Europe develops, uh, et cetera, but the, there is no mention. Marx, when he talks about primitive accumulation, this is a criticism that we made. Uh, what he's talking about, turning Africa into a worm for the commercial hunting of black skins. Well, what the hell is that? that and, and that's what he talks about in the process of development of human society. This is how human society develops from what he's characterized as primitive communism uh, through, uh, through slavery. In this instance, we're not talking about the enslaved trade that they imposed, that they characterize as the enslaved trade that we characterize as colonial slavery, primitive accumulation, uh, to, to, to slavery, uh, to feudalism, to capitalism is the process that they talk about. And this is, and then this primitive accumulation that he mentions uh, is the thing that moves Europe uh, from, uh, from, and, uh, from this point of uh, feudal existence now uh, to capitalism. The, the primitive accumulation, uh, it doesn't define, this, this understanding that by Marx doesn't define what happened to Africa is nothing in there. There's nothing even implicit in there about what happens to Africa, except it's turned into a war for the commercial hunting of black skins. Uh, uh, and, and that is uh, significant only as it relates to the development of human society, which has to be European society, it's, if it's gonna be development, because certainly uh, 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 turning Africa into a war for the commercial hunting of black skins is not development for Africa. Certainly this primitive accumulation that they characterize uh, 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 as, as leading to the development uh, is, is not a development for the indigenous people and, and living in the Americas. Uh, uh, certainly it's not development for China. Uh, that was that uh, where, where uh, the British uh, initiated this, this, this war, 1841-42, the Opium War to to force China to, to uh, become a nation of junkies so that all of these resources come to Europe. Everything that we're talking about, Europe is a subject and the rest of us are simply objects of, of that development. And objects in this instance can be seen uh, also as these atoms that, that uh, Marx complained, that the Marxists complained uh, as, a, as a standpoint of feudal 
uh, a philosophy, a, a feudalistic worldview. And we can see that this carries on uh, into uh, Europe because it's a colonial worldview. That the colonial worldview acts in the same fashion because it cannot uh, perceive and understand uh, the, the history uh, uh, of uh, other peoples, et cetera, as their own history with its own significance. And they cannot understand how things have transformed, uh, not just the so-called native people, uh, but the whole world now gets transformed. You got an entirely different uh, situation, different relationship uh, 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 than what existed uh, uh, prior to this, this connection. So the, it seems like this whole concept of the atom and the world being just these different atoms, you know, uh, uh, interacting and bumping into each other carries on to even Marxist philosophy. Say uh, that, that uh, uh, on, again, we're uh, at uh, page 32, uh, say uh, such a theory is equivalent to regarding the whole world as nothing but a complex piece of machinery, a, a mechanism. From this standpoint, the question always posed about any part of nature is the question we ask about a machine. What is, it, what is its mechanism? How does it work? This was exemplified in Newton's account of, of the solar system. Newton adopted the same general view as the Greek for a materialist Epicurus, in as much as he thought that the material world consisted of particles moving about an empty space. But faced with any particular natural phenomena, such as the movements of the sun and the planets, Epicurus was not in the least conceived to give any exact account of it. With regards to the apparent movement of the sun across the heavens from east to west, for example, Epicurus said the important thing was to understand that the sun was not a god, but was simply a collection of atoms. No account of the actual machinery of its motions was necessary. Perhaps he says the sun goes around and round the earth, but perhaps it disintegrates and its atoms separate every night so that it's a new sun, which we see the next morning. To him, such questions were simply unimportant. Newton, on the other hand, his name was Isaac Newton, uh, was concerned to show exactly how the solar system worked, to demonstrate the mechanics of it in terms of gravity and mechanical forces. But just as Epicurus was not interested in how the solar system worked, so Newton was not interested in how it originated and developed. He took it for granted as a staple piece of machinery created presumably by God, not how it originated, not how it developed, but how it worked uh, was the question that he, which he dealt with. Uh, 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 the same mechanistic approach was manifested in Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood. The essence of his discovery was that he demonstrated a mechanism of circulation regarding the heart as a pump, which pumps the blood out along the artery so that it flows back through the veins, the whole system being regulated by a series of, back, of, of, of valves. And so to understand the mechanistic outlook better, let us ask what is a mechanism? What is characteristics of a mechanism? Uh, a, a mechanism consists of permanent parts which fit together. B, it requires a motive force to set it going. C, once set going, the parts interact and results are produced according to laws which can be exactly stated. Let me just say that uh, uh, again, the, the idea of, of, of uh, materialism is the thing that we are considering here. And we're saying that materialism uh, is important and as a, as a, a, a way of, of, uh, of, of, of understanding uh, things, uh, it was a, a great improvement on the philosophical idealism that was connected, uh, deeply connected uh, uh, primarily uh, to feudalism. So this was a great improvement, even if they, uh, didn't have understand all the questions. The fact is that they're not saying that the gods did it, etc. They just they, but they are inferring it because something a, 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 a mechanism something has to start it up, and uh, uh, and so this start up thing, uh, this this external force uh, could be characterized as God or what have you. And here it says, consider for example, this is page thirty three. Such a mechanism as a watch, A, it consists of a number of different parts, cogs, levers, and so on, fitted neatly together. B, it has to be wound up. C, then as the springs uncoil, the parts interact according to laws exactly known to watchmakers, resulting in the regular movements of the hands on the dial. Further, to know how a mechanism such as a watch works, you, you must take it to bits 
find out what his parts are, how they fit together, and how by their interactions, once the mechanism is set in motion by the application of the required motive force, they produce the total motion characteristic of the mechanism in working order. This is how the mechanistic materialists regarded nature. They sought to, make, to take nature to bits, to find this ultimate component parts, how they fit it together, and how their interactions produce all the changes we perceive, all the phenomenon of the world. And moreover, finding out how the mechanism worked, they sought to find out how to repair, how to improve it, how to change it, and to make it produce new results corresponding to the requirements of man. So this is a uh, uh, first we, con we concede that, uh, uh, that materialism is better than idealism and understand the world. And then we see that how materialism in Europe seems to uh, uh, stem uh, from uh, uh, European uh, development uh, and how the mechanical sciences uh, uh, were predominant and material, ma mechanistic materialism uh, was really something that was uh, uh, important in terms of uh, philosophy, how to understand it according from that standpoint in Europe. And so uh, the strength and achievement of mechanistic materialism. This is page 33. Mechanistic materialism was an important milestone in our understanding of nature. And uh, it was a great progressive step of bourgeois thinkers, a blow against idealism. Uh, the mechanists, uh, the mecha mechanists uh, were thoroughgoing in their materialism, for they waged a progressive fight against idealism and clericalism by trying to extend to the realm of mind and society the same me mechanistic conceptions that were used in the scientific investigation of nature. They sought to include man and all his spiritual activities in the mechanistic system of the natural world. The most radical mechanist, mechanist regarded not merely physical processes and not merely uh, plant and animal life, but man himself as a machine. Already in the 17th century, 1600 or something, the great French philosopher Descartes uh, had said that all animals were complicated machines, uh, automata. Uh, but man was different since he had a soul. This is what Descartes was saying. But in the 18th century, a follower of Descartes, the physician uh, Lemaitre, uh, uh, wrote a book with a provocative title, Man a Machine. Uh, men too were machines, he said, though very complicated ones. Uh, this doctrine was looked upon as, a, as exceptionally shocking and as a terrible insult to human nature, not to mention God. Yet it was in its time a progressive view of man. The view that men are machines was an advance in the understanding of human nature as compared with the view that they were wretched pieces of clay inhabited by immortal souls. And it was, comparatively speaking, a more humane view. For example, the great English materialist and utopian socialist Robert Owen told the pious industrialists of his time, quote, experience has shown you the difference of the result between mechanism, uh, which is neat, clean, well arranged, and always in a high state of repair, and that which is allowed to be dirty and disorder, and which therefore becomes out of repair. If then, do care as to the state of your inanimate machines uh, uh, can produce such beneficial results, what may not be expected if you devote equal attention to your vital machines, which are far more wonderfully constructed, the vital machines, of course, being human beings. This humanitarianism, uh, however, was at best bourgeois humanitarianism. Like all mechanistic materialism, it was rooted in the class outlook of the bourgeoisie. The view that man is a machine is rooted in the view that in production, man is a mere appendage of the machine. And if on the one hand, this implies <laughs> that the human machine ought to be well tended and kept in good condition, on the other hand, it equally implies that no more should be expended for this purpose than is strictly necessary to keep the human machine in bare working order. So we're looking now at the weakness and limitations of mechanistic materialism. I know I'm rushing through this, comrades. Uh, again, uh, you have to look at this yourself, and I hope you'll look at, at it with the ability to reflect on it uh, based on what we've already talked about. Uh, in the previous uh, studies, and, uh, and, and you can reflect on it based on what's been written in the various political reports uh, and other things that's been produced by the party. 
So mechanistic materialism had grave weaknesses. One, it could not sustain the materialist standpoint consistently and all the way. For if a world is like a machine, who made it? Who started it up? Uh, there was necessary in any system of mechanistic materialism a supreme being outside the material world. And even if he no longer continuously in, interfered in the world and kept things moving, but did no more than start things up and then watch what happened. Such a supreme being, being was postulated by nearly all the mechanistic materialists, for example, by Voltaire uh, and Tom Paine. But this opens the door to idealism. Mechanistic materialism sees change everywhere, yet because it always tries to reduce all phenomena to the same system of mechanical interactions, it sees, it sees this change as nothing but the eternal repetition of the same kind of mechanical processes and eternal cycle of the same changes. This limitation is inseparable from the view of the world as a machine. For just as a machine has to be started up, so it can never do anything except what it was made to do. It cannot change itself or produce anything radically new. Mechanistic theory therefore always breaks down when it is a question of accounting for the emergence of new quality. It sees change everywhere, but nothing new, no development. The various processes of nature, chemical processes and the processes of living matter, for example, cannot in fact be all reduced to one and the same kind of mechanical interaction of material particles. Chemical interactions differ from mechanical interactions. Inasmuch as the changes which take place as a result of chemical interactions, <coughs> involve a, a change of quality. For example, if we consider the mechanical interaction of two particles which collide, <laughs> then their qualitative characteristics are irrelevant. And the result is expressed as a change in the quantity and direction of motor, motion of each. But if two chemical substances come together and combine chemically, then there results a new substance qualitatively different from either. Similarly, from the point of view of mechanics, heat is nothing but an increase in the quantity of motion of the particles of matter. But if chemistry, but in chemistry, the application of heat leads to qualitative changes. Nor do the processes of nature consist in the repetition of the same cycle of mechanistic interaction. But in nature, there's continual development and evolution, producing ever new forms of the, of the existence or what is the same thing, motion of matter. Hence, the more widely and consistently the mechanistic categories are applied in the interpretation of nature, the more is their essential limitations exposed. Three, still less can mechanistic materialism explain social development. Mechanistic materialism expresses the radical bourgeois conception of society as consisting of social atoms interacting together. The real economic and social causes of the development of society cannot be discovered from this point of view. <laughs> and so great social changes seem to spring from quite accidental causes. Human activity itself appears to be either the mechanical result of external causes or else it is treated. And here me me mechanistic uh, materialism collapses into idealism as purely spontaneous and uncaused. In a word, mechanistic materialism cannot give an account of men's social activity. And, and you know, we see this all the time. Um, uh, they, you know, sometimes it's referred to uh, as the invisibility of uh, Africans and other people as, as European Europeans, um, uh, even though we've been uh, integral to the uh, existence and creation, creation and existence and functioning of the, of the existing uh, social system, uh, uh, Europe, Europeans, um, the colonizers have been incapable of actually seeing us. And, uh, uh, and, and, and therefore it's, uh, it's, it's similar to what we're talking about now in terms of a certain kind of mechanistic materialism. They know we are there, uh, they, uh, but they can't give a, a real account of, uh, of the social activity and, and, uh, and social changes. The great changes seem to spring from some accidental cause this rebellion here, you know, uh, it was somebody got shot or you know, black people upset because of uh, something that seems to have no relationship at all uh, to anything in the world. Uh, what's happening in Africa? How in the hell can, it, how is it even possible uh, for uh, Europe or America uh, and, and by which I mean more or less the same thing, uh, uh, explain uh, the, 
the, the, the relationship of the poverty of the indigenous people whose land this was, uh, the African people who were brought here forcibly to work on this land, and their wealth. How can they possibly not see that there is a connection here, that there is a relationship here? Uh, but they don't see the relationship. They can talk about all the bad things that's happened to Black people. And yes, white people may have had something to do with it, uh, but they can't talk about this as a relationship. And that's what we're looking at. That for there to be, uh, this is what we see in the party all the time. If you admit to the existence of the oppressed, uh, if we are oppressed, then there must be an oppressor. You're talking about a relationship. You're talking about uh, there cannot be an oppressed without an oppressor, uh, that there is a unity of opposites here. One cannot exist without the other, any more than you can talk about up without recognizing there's such a thing that, that's called down. It is a unity of opposite here. We're talking about a relationship, not just some things bouncing around, uh, bumping into each other, uh, accidentally out there in the world. And this is what, uh, why we're saying that even though uh, what's been talked about here uh, 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 as uh, something that was uh, uh, peculiar to or particular to uh, the fuel mode of production, we're saying that even uh, Marx's, uh, 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 Marx's uh, uh, worldview uh, of, of, of function in the same way because uh, you can have a communist colonizer you can have a, a reactionary fascist capitalist colonizer. The thing is, colonialism is the defining question. And that's the thing that, and, and it, was, it was colonialism that gave rise to the capitalist system itself and created a whole different set of relationships in the world. That's what we're looking at. That's what African internationalism helps us to understand. This is why African internationalism is so important because it explains the world just like it is uh, and it, it, it makes an assault on all of these assumptions that there can be a world that is improved uh, for the peoples uh, without an assault on the colonial relationship that we're talking about, overthrowing colonialism, overthrowing white power. Uh, uh, and, and this is the new world that African internationalism introduces us to. And this is why it's so important uh, for us to look at this issue of philosophy as something uh, uh, more significant, more important than just uh, helping people to understand different kind of fancy words, uh, something that's uh, something that only uh, the, uh, uh, the educated uh, African petty bourgeoisie or something like that should uh, be involved in, in dealing with. Uh, so uh, uh, comment, uh, Director, uh, how should we be moving now? Should I, should I continue or? or Chairman, yeah, I think you should continue because there's a good stopping point on page 38. Okay, so, uh, and so, you know, uh, this is really important because uh, what African internationalism does is uh, it opens up the world. It makes a major assault on a worldview that was imposed on, on, on all of us uh, through, with the advent of this of this whole colonial uh, capitalist uh, social system, this colonial mode of production brought with it, the colonial mode of production brought, brought with it uh, a worldview. And because we are talking about a, a mode of production uh, 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 with the colonizer being the uh, critical dominating force that controls everything, uh, defines everything. So the whole world has been defined from the perspective of the colonizer. Even the colonized have come to, be, have begun to understand ourselves from the perspective of the colonizer, not from our reality. And so we can meet Vietnamese, uh, Cuban, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, African uh, uh, Marxists who define the world uh, as developing as a consequence what of so-called primitive accumulation, which is, which is uh, something that uh, minimizes or obscures uh, the history and struggle of African people and make us something that simply function or our existence being something that, uh, 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 is something that uh, facilitates the growth and development of Europe and European society. So the whole world now sees uh, it the same way. The oppressed and the oppressor are looking at the world through the same lenses, understanding the same. And I say the oppressor. I'm not talking about the quote, quote unquote, just the capitalist oppressor. 
I'm talking about the colonialist oppressor, the colonial capitalism is what we're looking at because what colonialism did uh, was to change the relationship between the serf and the peasants and to bring them on board with the ruling class, uh, with this emerging social force uh, in opposition and extracting value uh, and resources from those of us who are being colonized. And this is the beginning of the consolidation of the European national consciousness and national identity. So they're no longer uh, 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 Celts and they are no longer Normans and, and uh, Saxons and things like that in terms of their primary identity. Their primary identity now becomes European identity and it becomes a European identity as a part of, uh, as a consequence of this process of, uh, of, of, of uh, economic and po uh, political uh, process and economic process that gives uh, uh, significance and unity to them and a different consciousness of who they are, a sense of sameness uh, that we call national consciousness comes about as a consequence of this new world economy. All of them, whether it comes out French, Belgians, Swiss, uh, Germans, Americans, uh, Canadians, uh, uh, et cetera, all of them uh, have everything they have, whether it's the working class, middle class, homosexuals, heterosexual, men, women, all of them have a primary identity as a consequence of what they are stealing and ripping off from the oppressed of the world. And the mistake that too many of us make because we do not have access to African internationalism is understand the world again from the perspective of a colonizer. And you find homosexual colonizers, women colonizers, and people more and more reading about how women own slaves, white women own slaves, and white homosexuals uh, own slaves. Uh, uh, Cecil Rose, who made this horrible assault uh, on Africa, was a homosexual. And, and the, the point is that the fundamental contradiction that divides people in the world is the relationship between oppressed and oppressed nations. That is the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. And this is a whole new world economy within which uh, all of the activity and even the ideas uh, that we uh, deal with uh, are born and nurtured and, and uh, all of this uh, uh, comes as a consequence of colonialism. So, and, and, and so we say, uh, in the word mechanistic materialism cannot give an account of men's social activity. <laughs> the mechanistic view treated men quite abstractly, each man being regarded as a social atom endowed by nature with certain inherent properties, attributes, and rights. This was expressed in the bourgeois conceptions of the rights of man. <coughs> and the bourgeois revolutionary slogan, all men are equal. But the conception of human rights cannot be deduced from the abstract nature of man, but is determined by the stage of society in which they are living. Nor are men what they are by nature, but they become what they are and change as a result of their social activity, nor are all men by nature equal. In opposition to the bourgeois conception of abstract equality, which amounted to mere formal equality of rights as citizens, equality before the law, Marx and Engels declared, quote, the real content of the proletarian demand for equality is the demand for the abolition of classes. Any demand for equality which goes beyond that of necessity passes into absurdity. And this, we will say any content, any real content of the proletarian demand for equality is demand for the abolition of colonialism, colonialism. And any demand for equality which goes beyond that is of necess necessity passes into absurdity. And this is the struggle that we involved in on a regular basis even today. And so adopt, adopting their abstract mechanistic view of men as social atoms, the progressive me mechanists tried to work out in an abstract way what form of society would be best for mankind? What would be what would best suit abstract human nature as they conceived of it? This way of thinking was taken over by the socialist thinkers who immediately preceded Marx, the utopian socialists. The utopian socialists were mechanistic materialists. They put forward socialism as an ideal society. They did not see it as necessitated by the development of the contradictions of capitalism. They did not see socialism uh, as necessitated by the development of the contradictions of capitalism. It could have been put forward and realized at any time, if only men had had the wit to do so. This is how they understood the world and still do. They did not see it as having to be won by working class struggle against colonialism. It would be realized when everyone was convinced 
that it was just and best adapted to the requirements of human nature. For this reason, Robert Owen appealed to both the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, and Queen Victoria to support his socialist program. And this is uh, also what we see uh, with the guy uh, who wrote uh, uh, Christmas Carols. You know, he had uh, uh, Scrooge, the, the, the prototypical uh, capitalist uh, who was oppressive and bad. And, and all we had to do was show him that, you know, that how bad he was treating everybody and Christmas past and Christmas present and all these ghosts come and change his mind. And Ebenezer Scrooge is a different person. This was a utopian socialist assumption that the reason that, that the capitalists did what they did, the oppressor do what they do, uh, is that, uh, that uh, somehow they don't understand what's best for everybody, et cetera. And they liquidate the fact that there's a material basis for what it is that they're looking at. So these were characterized as utopian socialists. And the idea of scientific socialism uh, demands, requires of us that we discover uh, and explore the material basis for the existence of this capitalist system. And when we do that, uh, successfully, then we come to understand that the material basis of it is colonialism, the capture and turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial and hunting of black skins. The in turn, the indigenous peoples of the Americas are into mines where they work from can't see in the day, can't see at night, and these mines bring up gold and silver that went to Europe, uh, and the various other kinds of things like this that we call colonialism that created the, 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 the uh, world economy. So, uh, uh, again, the mechanistic materialists, and this applies above all to the utopian socialists, started that, that what a man was, his character and his activities was determined by his environment and education. Therefore, they, they proclaimed that to make men better, happy and more rational, it was simply necessary to place them in better conditions and give them a better education. But to this, Marx replied, the materialist doctrine that men are products of circumstances and upbringings and that therefore changed men are produced by changed circumstances and changed upbringing forgets that circumstances are changed precisely by men and that the educator him, must himself be educated, unquote. If men are simply the products of circumstances, then they are at the mercy of circumstances. But on the contrary, men can themselves change their circumstances. And men themselves are changed, not in a mechanical, not as a mechanical result of changed circumstances, but in the course of, and as a result of, their own activity in changing their circumstances. So what are the real material uh, social causes that work in human society, which, gives rise, which give rise to new activities, new ideas, and therefore to change circumstances and change men? Mechanistic materialism cannot answer this question. It cannot explain the laws of social development nor show how to change society. Therefore, while it was a progressive and revolutionary doctrine in its time, it could not serve to guide the struggle of the working class and striving to change society. Uhuru. So uh, I think this is where you wanted us to stop. Was that correct, uh, comment director? Uhuru Chairman, yes, um, at the top here. And that last statement kind of seems um, relevant to this document, <laughs> this document written by Maurice Cornforth in terms of it being. <laughs> so Uhuru, but I just want to salute uh, this political education chairman continuing deepening our understanding of dialectical materialism as it relates to the development and understanding of the world through African internationalism. Um, this just continues to be a very profound and timely discussion and our viewers uh, would likely agree in the chat section. In fact, several of them already have. So um, before we get into our Q&A section, uh, we're going to go through our announcements. So if you have not asked a question, go ahead and type that into the chat section on both Facebook and or YouTube. And we'll go ahead and pot up those announcements. <clears throat> Ask my engineer. That's you. There we go. All right. So this study is being brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, winning the war of ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. And we encourage everyone watching today, if you are not already subscribed to the Burning Spear newspaper, to get a one-year subscription today. 12 issues delivered straight to your door for $25 
or the digital edition delivered to your email inbox. Get a combo of both for 20% off. And you can also gift a subscription to comrades and family members and donate to sponsor prisoner subscription. You can do all of this at theburningsphere.com slash subscribe. Next. Calling on all spirit distributors. Chairman did an awesome plug at the beginning of this study. The December spear is here. If you haven't purchased your bundle, order now. Get the spear out into your community, and you can do that by going to burningspearmarketplace.com. Black Power 96. Um, Amali Taught Me airs on Black Power 96 FM radio, a project of the African People's Education and Defense Fund, with the slogan, not just explaining the world, but changing it. Listen on 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida, or streaming online at blackpower96.org. And on the free Black Power 96 mobile app, download the app, whether you have Apple or Android from your Google Play Store or your um, Apple App Store. So download the Black Power 96 mobile app. The theory of African internationalism is a theory of practice. All the energy of the African People's Socialist Party is focused on the destruction of colonial capitalism. Africans of the world, go to our website, apspohuru.org, and fill out our contact form. Give the gift of African internationalism. Visit burningspermarketplace.com for books and literature by Chairman Amalia Shitella and other Uhuru movement leaders. Check out the pamphlet section with reissued and vintage pamphlets, including The New Period and Smash Slander, which have been discussed in previous Omali Taught Me studies and Report from the Mountain. These are critical African internationalist texts that are still relevant today. Check out the new Thinking About Uhuru hat and stock up on your African flags. Go to burningspermarketplace.com. And one place where you can pick up all of that literature and political gear is at Burning Spear Media's Cyber Monday Live sales event. Hack the mainframe by supporting independent Black Power Media and get your hands on African internationalist literature and merchandise that arms us to engage and win this war of ideas. We will have new items, deals on book bundles, and some very special limited quantity items from the archives that will be available for auction, including one copy of a vintage Black Panther newspaper featuring cover art by Emery Douglas and a rare demo tape by Dead Prez. Tune in Monday, November 29th at 3 p.m. Eastern on the Burning Spear TV YouTube channel or the Burning Spear Facebook page. The following day, Giving Tuesday, November 30th, beginning at 7 a.m. and going until Wednesday, December 1st at 7 a.m., don't miss the 24-hour Reparations Telethon, a 24-hour celebration of African self-determination to raise resources for the Black Power Blueprints basketball court. The program is packed with speakers, culture, and so much more. RSVP by going to tinyurl.com slash reparations telethon and donate to this important project at gofundme.com slash community basketball. Come to the first ever One Africa, One Nation holiday marketplace in Philadelphia, Saturday, December 4th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern at the Lucian Blackwell Center in West Philly. This African style marketplace is an economic development project of the African People's Education and Defense Fund and Black Star Industries. Shop from a wide variety of vendors presenting everything from crafts, food, jewelry, and more. Volunteers and vendors are welcome. For more information, visit uhuruflemarket.blogspot.com or call 267-875-3532. Calling on all party in Uhuru movement members and supporters, attend the 2022 plenary conference of the African People's Socialist Party, February 11th through 13th, 2022, themed Relentless 50 Years of Leadership Towards African Redemption. Our plenaries and congresses have become the vehicles for an ongoing assessment of our work and the conditions in the world affecting our struggle for total liberation. Registration for this three-day virtual conference costs just $25. Read the full call to attend written by Chairman Amalia Shetela and register by going to APSPplenary.org. Like and follow the Loazi Kinshasa like page on Facebook for more African internationalist political education. Secretary General Loazi does frequent live events such as the War of Ideas series. He includes live sessions done in French. To get alerts of when SG Loazi is going live, make sure to like and follow his page today. 
Ahura Foods and Pies is hiring for a part-time baker in both Oakland, California and St. Petersburg, Florida, and culinary training is preferred. Join the work to build an independent African economy by baking for Black power. To apply, email your resume to oakland.volunteer at ahurufoods.org or, or mail your resume to 7911 MacArthur Boulevard, Oakland, California, 94605, or call 800-578-5157 for more information. Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles in both Oakland and Philly are hiring full-time truck drivers and full-time marketing coordinators. If you have driving and furniture lifting skills, social media and print marketing experience, and you can work Wednesday through Sunday, then this job is for you. Apply for these positions and contribute your skill and labor and skills to this institution of the African People's Education and Defense Fund. Apply by visiting their website in Oakland, uhurufurniture.blogspot.com. And in Philadelphia, that's ahurufurniturephilly.blogspot.com. On Tuesday nights from 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern, join Ralph Pointer on What's Happening Blog Talk Radio. Tune in by calling 347-857-3293. Ralph Pointer sits on the Black is Back Coalition Steering Committee and chairs the BIBC's Political Prisoners Working Group and also leads the Lynn Stewart Committee. And we're calling on people to follow the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project on Facebook or visit developmentforafrica.org for important information and helpful tips in regards to the colonial virus COVID-19. APDEP has an international telehealth program, a free resource for African people to get our COVID-19 related questions and concerns answered by licensed doctors and nurses through Project Black Ankh. Make your free virtual appointment with one of their professional health providers by going to developmentforafrica.org slash telehealth. To keep up with our movement events, visit the burningspear.com's events page and subscribe to our mailing list. And for our last announcement, make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Omali Taught Me Sunday study and support the Omali Taught Me show by donating now at paypal.me slash Oh, Molly taught me. So that includes today's announcements. Thank you, engineer. And so now we're going to get into questions and answers. Chairman, we do have several questions in, and I just want to acknowledge where people are viewing from. Miami, Florida, St. Louis, Missouri, Moorhead, Minnesota, Fort Myers, Florida, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Battle Creek, Michigan, Houston, Texas, Richmond, Virginia, San Diego, California, Lakeland, Florida, Oakland, California, Phoenix, Arizona, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Chicago, Illinois, Portland, Oregon, Washington, DC, Occupy Zania or South Africa, and Hempstead, New York, all tuning in with us. So who comrades? So Chairman, our first question, um, these actually came off of last week's study that we did that we had to post on your, on your Facebook and the Burning Spur TV YouTube. Um, this first question came from Diop in Philadelphia. He asked Uhuru, what do you think about the Ahmad Arbery murder trial? Well, thank you, uh, Kermit, Director. Before going to that, I just want to say that um, the, um, the plenary, uh, being in February, uh, the great likelihood is going to be at least four days. And so people should anticipate that. Uh, the last plenary was uh, really tight with four days. And this one is, currently has been scheduled three days, but I'm sure we're going to be at least four days. This one, and so more information will be coming. And the discussion was around Ahmad uh, Arbery's trial and, um, uh, and what was thought about it. Well, the first thing is that um, the, the trial itself and how it was conducted um, speaks to uh, real contradictions that are deepening and uh, glaringly uh, there for anybody to see uh, and the inability of the ruling class to rule in the same old way that uh, uh, despite uh, uh, what many thought would have been uh, not guilty verdicts uh, for the murderers, uh, despite the fact that uh, there were guilty verdicts. Uh, I think there are a couple of things that need to be noticed. One, the way uh, the defense characterized uh, Arbery uh, during this, in, this uh, entire uh, trial and especially during the sum up uh, uh, and uh, was, which was grotesquely obscene. Uh, uh, it was something that spoke to uh, what 
the uh, defense, his, the, their defense uh, seem being ma made manifest daily uh, in, in the United States and around the world. Uh, this growing antipathy of the colonizers and this is mass colonial antipathy uh, to uh, African people, the willingness it appears of, uh, of uh, white people to uh, abandon any sense of, uh, of uh, morality, even bourgeois morality uh, as it's normally understood uh, to carry out the mission of, uh, of uh, brutalizing and punishing and, and, and lynching uh, African people. This was something that was assumed. The characterization of uh, Aubrey, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this woman's dead son, uh, uh, and this uh, African from our community is uh, somebody with short pants and no socks and dirty toenails uh, uh, that would have been observed, toenails that would have been observed after he was dead uh, was uh, just uh, something that she, the, 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 the defense knew would play well uh, to uh, the sentiments of uh, ordinary white people in this country at this time and uh, uh, to the jurors. And so you have a situation where at least 19 uh, states in, in this country now have moved uh, to limit the ability of African people to vote. Uh, they are, are, are seeing in so many different ways that the uh, so-called democratic institutions don't count when it comes to African people. Uh, uh, the fact that on January 6th, uh, that the, the year opened uh, with an assault on uh, by colonizers against other colonizers uh, uh, because of deepening contradictions revolving around colonialism. Uh, th th she read that absolutely correctly. That is to say the woman who I saw functioning uh, to uh, in defense of, of, the, of the three of the murderers. Uh, and the fact that in this instance, uh, uh, there was a guilty verdict does not, uh, say anything about the intent and the sentiments, the deep and profound colonialist sentiment that exists here. Uh, uh, and so if anything happened, uh, it, it was that, uh, uh, that, uh, that the sentiments did not prevail uh, in this particular instance for any number of reasons. People are extolling I don't know, how this verdict, uh, uh, guilty verdict came about and what you can say to white people and therefore and the other thing, of course, is the fact that Aubrey was murdered. It was a colonial murder. It's the kind of thing that happens on a daily basis in this country, and that cannot be liquidated. You're looking at a, uh, a, a, uh, uh, a, a consequence of deep and profound antipathy colonial, about the colonizers uh, uh, toward those of us who are colonized. And that takes us even to what we're looking at in terms of the philosophy uh, when you look at uh, uh, the dialectic and historical materialist uh, understanding of the world and how uh, the world is perceived by different uh, social forces, and you're talking about the colonizer uh, who, uh, generally speaking, has proved quite willing uh, to commit all kinds of offenses and have, do have, have done it, uh, 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 committed all kinds of offenses. And so the, the Arbery thing might have been an abnormally uh, in the sense that they did not get the, the verdict that they were looking for. And I don't know all of the details. Uh, I know that it's got nothing to do with uh, the songs being uh, sung now about how uh, you know, there's a special way that you can talk to white people and get them uh, to do what is just by African people. We're talking about a relationship uh, 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 that is uh, uh, based on uh, colonialism. And, and, and the murder was based on colonialism. And there's gonna be another one in Georgia and more in Georgia and other places around this country. And sometimes there'll be guilty verdicts and sometimes there won't be. Uh, but the fact is that uh, uh, the sentiment of the white people in this country reflected in his killing, uh, reflected in what we saw with Rittenhouse, reflected in January 6th, reflected in the state houses around the country changing the law to prohibit black people from voting all of this stuff uh, is telling us where we're going. And so anybody who reads anything significant about, wow, we finally won something, like those idiots like Sharpton and, and uh, Crump, uh, who uh, uh, the lawyer and, and the civil rights guys who, uh, who were down there making the assumption that, uh, uh, that, wow, we really got something, some victory here, this, it's, it's an obscenity. And that's why African internationalism and African People's Socialist Party, uh, the Uhuru movement are so important.
uh, right now. Uhuru, come at Diop. Uhura Chairman, and thank you, Diop, for your question. I know that's like a burning one for lots of people. Um, <clears throat> another question that came in from last week, this is the last one from last week, came from Malcolm uh, on Facebook. And uh, he asked, what was Lenin's view on materialism versus idealism? Well, Lenin was pretty clear on this issue of materialism versus idealism. He was a philosophical materialist, as am I, as, as uh, is uh, the African People's Socialist Party, uh, as is the uh, Uhuru movement overall, uh, philosophical materialism is, is, is uh, uh, what uh, guides our, our worldview, which, which informs us, uh, et cetera. And Lenin was clearly uh, a, a materialist as opposed, and was uh, opposed to uh, uh, any form of idealism. Where was that from and whom? Um, this was from Malcolm. They seem to be a, a new viewer, actually. I have um, Malcolm on Facebook. Yes, Malcolm. Thank you for the question. I want to say, uh, Comrade uh, Director and Diop, you'll be asking, somebody's going to be asking this question next week and the week after that. What do you think about the outcome of this verdict, that verdict, this verdict? Because the system is going to continue acting just as it does act now. And uh, depending upon whatever uh, power or influence or circumstances uh, uh, may exist uh, uh, at the moment, uh, then uh, uh, a verdict, uh, uh, you know, uh, will, it will reflect that. But the fact is colonialism is at work. And that means that they're going to keep killing uh, until the Africans uh, make a move uh, to make that a costly uh, act and make it costly. Uh, to deliver consequences when that happened in the process of, of taking our total uh, liberation, our total freedom, and take it out of the hands of, uh, of charlatans and, and people who engage in, in obscurant, philosophical obscurantism to make it appear that somehow that something is written on a piece of paper called a constitution or a bill of rights or something like that is a driving force that will determine whether or not African people have rights. Uh, we even went over this whole question about uh, everybody's supposed to be equal. As Constitution said, all of us are equal. Or the Bill of Rights, or some Declaration of Independence, just spoke to the equality of human beings. When it's nothing but words, uh, there's a material relationship uh, that we uh, uh, live with, and that is colonialism. And colonialism requires; it absolutely requires; it demands uh, brutality uh, against us, and it demands that it happens even uh, if it happens within what is called the law. In fact, uh, the reason that there's any confusion around this question at all is because uh, how white people experience capitalism is different from how African people experience capitalism. And that's because of the colonial factor. And that's because of what has been characterized in many instances as uh, a hidden uh, dictatorship when it comes to white people that the capitalist system does not expose itself in a certain way because you do have, generally speaking, the benefit of trials and the benefits of voting and the benefits of, uh, of at least uh, some appearance of, uh, of, uh, of law. Uh, but for African people, there is the dictatorship is not hidden. That's why you will see the difference in when you see certain kinds of oppression exploitation happen, uh, that even the white people do not, they, they talk about fascism when there's any uh, thing that approximates what happens to African people. If that were uh, uh, what had happened to, uh, um, there, uh, uh, to uh, 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 what's the brother's name uh, that we were just uh, uh, if that kind of thing would happen to white people, it'd be characterized as fascism. Uh, but it happens to black people is normal. And so, what do you think of the trial? What do you think of the outcome of that trial? Uh, that the that the capitalist system exposes itself differently to African people, and that's because of colonialism. And the fact is that all white people are colonizers. And yet it doesn't say that there are no contradictions with, among the colonizers, but it does say that every contradiction that exists in this relationship uh, uh, exists uh, 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 within a relationship where the primary, fundamental, main uh, contradiction is that uh, between oppressed and oppressor nations, the colonized and the colonizers. And the co all the colonizers, including the ruling, ruling class, working class, men, women, homosexual, heterosexual, uh, trans, et cetera, all the colonizers uh, uh, exist 
uh, at the expense of all the colonized men, women, homosexual, heterosexuals, trans, and the rest of that. That, that divide is there, it's deep and profound, and it will not go away short of revolution, and it will not act differently short of uh, the power of African people to make the colonizer pay a consequence uh, for what he's doing uh, to the colonized. And sometimes we get diverted from that and, 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 and think that the fundamental question is something else because, uh, uh, so I just wanted to say that there, there are gonna be more of these trials. And this is a question that's gonna be asked uh, often because colonialism is gonna be here until we get rid of it. Uhuru, come here. Uhuru, Chairman. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, we were dealing with several trials last year, you know, so um, it's the same thing. The system is the same. So I uh, appreciate that answer and that response. Um, Comrade Timba from St. Louis. So now we're dealing with questions that come, have come in from today. Uh, Timba has, Uhuru Chairman, thank you for the theory of African internationalism. Why is it so important for Africans and other colonized people to understand that colonialism is a mode of production? Yeah, that's a fundamental question. And that's a major contribution that the African People's Socialist Party has brought uh, to, uh, uh, to theory. Uh, uh, theory uh, that will help us understand uh, everything in the world. And it's important that we understand colonialism as a mode of, a mode of production. Because otherwise, what happens is that African people uh, treat colonialism uh, as simply uh, a policy or they treat the consequences of colonialism as a policy. Certain kinds of things happen. So it's a policy of this government, that government, it's a policy of this president, that president, et cetera. And, uh, but colonialism as a mode of production helps us to understand that the very functioning of the society requires the relationship that we're looking at. It's not just a policy. And even if a particular government has a policy of colonialism, that policy functions within the context of a mode of production where colonialism uh, is the primary mode of production. Other stuff won't even work under these circumstances. So uh, I hope that was a, a response that uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, be helpful uh, for right now, Tim. But uh, it's, it's only when we understand that it has a mode of production that we understand that everything that occurs within it, not just in this country, not just in Georgia or Texas or something like that, but in the, on the whole world. We're looking at a, a, a mode of production that's called colonialism. African people have not yet broken free from the uh, mode of production that, uh, that uh, victimized us with colonial slavery, with the uh, division of Africa into these artificial, untenable entities that they call countries and uh, states and things like that. All of that has been imposed and maintained by a mode of production. And we say a mode of production because Europe and increasingly other parts of the world require Africa as this place uh, that, uh, uh, that where value is extracted for their own benefit. And the same is true of Africa, it's true of various places, the Americas and, and much of the world. Uh, and sometimes people find themselves breaking out of this or trying to break out of this. And how do they break out of it? By, not by overturning this mode of production, but trying to get a piece of the mode of production by trying to become one with this system of exploitation. Uh, at the time, there was a great Chinese revolution uh, uh, and revolutionaries that we appreciated so much because they were fighting against the whole social system. They presupposed that there was a connection between all the oppressed peoples of the world to overturn the social system. Now, what we see is that much of the world has come to accept the existence of the social system itself. And even as they make contests with uh, some of the ones who have been primary hegemons like the United States and, and, uh, and Europe or the European Union, et cetera, uh, they are not about trying to overturn. The revolution doesn't appear to be on the agenda. They're not talking about the uh, paper tiger that imperialism is, uh, overturning imperialism, the raise, rise, raising up of the oppressed and the workers and the peasants as a means by which this conquest uh, of power uh, occurs. They are trying to, they are in a contest uh, 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 within the existing colonial system to see who is going to uh, have greater advantages and who is going to be able to, uh, 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 to undermine the hegemonic role of the United States at this moment, but not to, for the workers and, and the peasants to overturn a whole system where the working class becomes the new ruling class. That's not even something that's being talked about today. So it's really important for us to understand, we're looking at a mode of production here. 
and uh, not just uh, uh, some policies that's coming uh, from uh, uh, a particular uh, uh, government. Uhuru Temba. Uhuru Temba, thank you for your question and thank you, Chairman, for your response. And we move to our next question, which comes from Comrade Demetria. Um, and Demetria asks, Uhuru Chairman, can you explain why it's necessary to cut these parasitic colonizers and capitalism off now by any means necessary? Um, first of all, I just want to really uh, express my appreciation to Comrade Demetria, uh, uh, extraordinary organizer um, up in Oregon, and uh, where they only recently uh, begun to allow African people to show our faces. Uh, but and everything that we've we've been involved in, Comrade Demetria uh, has uh, succeeded in organizing Africans and 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 bringing Africans uh, uh, to. Uh, the uh, the different events and, and and things like that we participated in, but yeah, uh, Demetra, uh, it's a really important question. It's a question that, in many ways, uh, uh, relate to the the point that Comrade Timber just made in terms of recognizing the mode of production uh, that colonialism is a mode of production. Uh, we, people get stuck, uh, and sometimes they think that. Uh, what we're looking at is just semantical differences when we say the struggle is not against racism, but against colonialism, a, a real material reality, not just something in the heads of people. And that gives us the ability to start constructing our freedom. And our freedom uh, comes about as a consequence of a process of liberating what we characterize as the productive forces, that is, anti-colonial movement. The productive forces, of course, is land. And, and that's part of a critical aspect of the productive forces and other things that's necessary for production including human beings. And so that's why you were looking to see the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, we've created uh, 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 these uh, programs and projects, Black Power Blueprints and things like that. Uh, and part of what we do, uh, why we do these things come at Demetri is to negate the power and influence of colonialism, of a colonizer. Uh, and even as we exist within uh, uh, this whole uh, world economy, the, we uh, and initiate uh, programs of dual uh, and contending power. Some people hear dual power and say, yeah, we're fighting for dual power, but it's not just dual power. It's a power that contends with the power of the colonizer. That's effectively what we do. And, and by any means necessary is actually uh, 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 what we are uh, uh, engaged in uh, in terms of this struggle against colonialism. But I appreciate uh, the question, uh, Comrade Demetria, and appreciate all of the work that you do uh, over there on the West Coast. Uhuru. 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 Demetria, thank you for your question and thank you, Chairman. Our next question comes from Comrade Director Chimarenga um, in St. Pete, Florida. So, the Uhuru Chairman, can you expound on what you said about the bourgeoisie not being revolutionaries when they overthrew feudalism? I didn't say that. I mean, uh, it may have been implicit. In what I said. Uh, they were revolutionary in the context of uh, this struggle that uh, existed inside Europe. Uh, inside Europe, you had a situation where there was, uh, you know, feudal domination, where the landowners, landlords, and nobility dominated uh, the peasants and the serfs who were tied to the land, etc. And clearly, uh, this new rising uh, social force inside uh, Europe was revolutionary as far as they were concerned, because what it did was uh, it freed them from the land. So now they were free to go uh, to leave the land. Uh, they had to be freed from the land because they had to work for this new social force and they had to be able to have social mobility. They had to be able to go and sell the labor power to the highest bidder. Uh, and, and that didn't always, uh, you know, that wasn't always, uh, you know, profoundly, uh, you know, beneficial people still living in horrible circumstances, but it was revolutionary in the sense that it, it freed the, those serfs and peasants uh, from their direct connection with the land. In terms of it being revolutionary, so that's the context within which it was revolutionary, uh, but uh, the bourgeoisie. But for African people, uh, we recognizing again that the pr profound, most important contradiction is that between oppressor and oppressor nations. Uh, and that the oppressor nation lives at the expense of the oppressed nations, uh, then uh, obviously it was not progressive uh, for, for us. The, the bourgeoisie was not progressive. In fact, uh, uh, this uh, bourgeoisie uh, was uh, 
uh, a, a force that uh, now had attained uh, 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 a supremacy uh, in the exploitation of Africans and other people. And now they are uh, forces that clearly uh, uh, work against progress. So, you know, you know, uh, it's only within that context, Tim and that we talk about the bourgeoisie, you know, being some kind of progressive force. Uh, it was a progressive force in Europe, you can say, uh, but it, even as it was being born, it was born at, it being born at the expense of, of the resources, the freedom and progress of the oppressed peoples of the world. So I guess I did say that, Tim Lorraine. I guess I did uh, say what was implied in, in the statement that you just made. It was a retardant on real progress. It was a retardant on real progress. The bourgeoisie, Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru. Thank you, Director Chimaranga, for your question. Um, our next question comes from Comrade Jamal um, in Moorhead, Minnesota. And he asks Uhuru Chairman, would it be correct to identify racism and what colonizers call fascism part of the superstructure? Uh, and certainly, uh, we can call racism part of a superstructure and um, and fascism. Um, yeah, I think that uh, fascism clearly is may may differ, and to the extent that when you look at fascism, uh, yeah, it is. You, yes, you can call it that because it is a, a form of the state. Uh, fascism. You look at fascism as a form of the state. It's a form of a state that's connected to uh, an economic base. And the economic base continues to be colonialism. And how uh, uh, this economic base articulates itself uh, at different times in different places around the world, and in Europe in particular, you will have the, uh, or not, the movement of uh, fascism as a, a political institution, which is a part of uh, uh, the superstructure of that economic base. So fascism, is a form of, a, it's a, yeah, it's part of the economic base in the same way that democracy uh, or, or racism are part of the economic base and the institutions that grow from this economic base are part of the, uh, uh, a part of the superstructure of that economic base. Yes, Comrade Jamal, I think that's right. Kuro Jamal, thank you for your question. Um, our next question, we have another one from Comrade Diop. And he asked, with regards to the discussion on dialectical materialism, are there any instances of situ or situations in which religious philosophies can be useful to struggles for national liberation and socialism? Well, you know, not religious philosophy as such. I mean, religious philosophy can take you only so far. I mean, uh, a lot of people, are, a lot of instances, people have rejected uh, uh, the consequences, uh, particularly of the Christians who came as colonizers in the last period uh, to Africa and to the Americas and things like that, and uh, who uh, 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 fell victim to uh, philosophical idealism and uh, you know created a situation of our idealism versus their idealism. Uh, they uh, that's how many Africans became what used to be characterized, uh, and perhaps it still is to some extent, black Muslims because uh, people recognize that, uh, that uh, the, the philosophical worldview uh, that was associated with Christianity, uh, you know, kept people, Africans on our knees and that was humiliating and understood that, uh, 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 you know, as the, we used to say in Africa that when the white man came here, we had the land, they had the Bible and we were taught to pull the eyes and pray and we opened our eyes and, and they had the, the land and, and we had the Bible, et cetera. So, you know, that was, a, a, a rejection, and there was an assumption that I thought pretty cynical uh, um, uh, early on in my life that uh, African people had to have a religion, uh, uh, and and that uh, uh, that you know, and Christianity was proof of that. So they, that African had to be given another religion to substitute for Christianity. So so uh, uh, philosophically, no, but there have been instances where a uh, uh, revolu religion. Uh, has been used um, uh, tactically uh, to advance our struggle. All in religion gonna take us to a dead end situation, uh, uh, to a dead end uh, situation. It's gonna, what appears to be uh, revolutionary. I mean, people talked about things like, um, what do they call it? Some kind of theology. What, how was it characterized? Um, 
uh, some kind of uh, some kind of revolutionary theology, which was essentially just another way that, uh, in the face of the growing uh, uh, struggles of the people uh, against uh, our oppression, um, that the, the ones who, uh, in many instances, were uh, the carriers of the liberation theology, yeah, that's what it was called. The ones who uh, uh, were, the, uh, in many instances, the advanced forces uh, who brought Christianity and made an assault on our belief system. Uh, and now uh, Christianity maintains this leverage and its significance uh, uh, by the so-called liberation theology. So you still <laughs> remain Catholic, you still remain tied to the Catholic Church. You still remain tied to imperialism through that, even as you talk about uh, overturning uh, oppressive situations, which means you might challenge various kinds of policies that's coming from the imperialists, but there's still uh, idealism, philosophical idealism. So uh, the way forward uh, is a total, uh, complete unity uh, with materialism as opposed to idealism. And, uh, 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 you know, I've used the example of how I think it might have been around 1979 uh, when uh, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, uh, they were uh, underground or in the mountains and things like that. And uh, a volcano happened uh, and, and uh, people you know, uh, were all masked up because of the, the ash from the volcano and the Sandinistas came down from the mountains and you know, they were wearing masks and couldn't be recognized like the rest of the people, and they would spread the thing that uh, that uh, the 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 uh, that uh, the volcanoes were doing what they were doing because God was angry with what uh, Somoza, who was the uh, uh, U.S. representative, who was uh, the white power uh, in brown face, uh, was bringing uh, to the people in in in, in Nicaragua, <laughs> and. Uh, but you know, just like uh, the the the, the uh, Sandinistas were able to do that, so could uh, uh, reactionaries do that, and they do that to us every day. I mean, they bring us God to in every murder that happens. They bring out uh, 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 char charlatan and and jackal and and uh, crump and what have you uh, to show evidence of uh, you know to to manipulate the consciousness of people based on uh, philosophical idealism. So that's you you will you will have that with philosophical idealism. Idealism is ultimately reactionary and uh who to come at the Uhuru. Uhuru Diop, thank you and thank you chairman. Um, so we are getting close to time. Uh, we have a question from Comrade Life and Life asks, Uhuru chairman, I so much appreciate this study and the theory of African internationalism. Can you say something about how critical it is that Africans are not merely spectators and articulators but are incessant participants participators in the process of overturning the social system and changing the world through everyday struggle. Thank you for my life. And in fact, that's critical to uh, uh, changing ourselves. Uh, I, I, I remember talking about, uh, you know, for a while, how uh, during the uh, civil rights movement, how uh, the fact is that, uh, that the African population uh, under the, in the United States, under the, the leadership of the uh, African uh, liberal sector of African petty bourgeoisie and the liberal ruling class had come uh, 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 into this uh, relationship that in many ways was to serve the, uh, the interests of the petty bourgeoisie and the, lib the liberal uh, uh, ruling class bourgeoisie in this country. And they created these circumstances for uh, a revolution from above around civil rights and the Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And how you know poor impoverished peasants and you know uh, uh, people living near peasantry like uh, like uh, 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 comrade um, uh, uh, the sister out of Mississippi, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, uh, you know never knew anything about politics, but as a part of the process of struggling around these questions uh, and struggling for freedom, masses of African people engaged in the struggle for freedom despite the fact that it was designed, the struggles were designed uh, to bring consequences that would benefit the African petty bourgeoisie and the liberal sector of the African ruling class in the process of doing that became changed and uh, the, wanted the, and demanded and went uh, further than where the African petty bourgeoisie and the liberal uh, sector of the ruling class could possibly go. That's how uh, the struggle around voting rights and things like that, uh, which was won, 
1965 and, uh, and 1966 Civil Rights Act, uh, or 1964 Civil Rights, 1965 Voting Rights, but 1966. <laughs> Having, having gone through all of that process, the masses who engage in struggle have become so changed, so transformed as a part of the process of changing the world uh, that they went further than either the African petty bourgeoisie, the liberal sector of African petty bourgeoisie, or uh, the ruling class or what possible, could possibly go. And they made the demand for power. Black power became the demand from that. So it's critical that the masses, and it's critical in our political work that we do wherever we're located in the world that we bring African people into active struggle to change their circumstances, change their lives. And which is when we're at our best time in life, that's what we do. And, uh, and you can see the evidence of that uh, in the various places where we're located. So critical, we've always said that the people are the real makers of history. And the people, we have to facilitate the, the entry of the masses of African people into this process of making history. Uh, and uh, uh, so anyway, that's what most of our programs are designed to do, our campaigns are designed to do. That's why we do things, people say, well, why are you gonna have another, dem what do demonstrations do? Demonstrations uh, simply, uh, it, it uh, uh, raises the, and heightens the capacity of the people to struggle. It teaches people how to struggle and things like that. We do all kinds of things and not just that, we have institutionalized uh, uh, mass uh, 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 campaigns, uh, uh, projects, Black Power Blueprint, designed to bring people into it. And uh, it's really interesting because the African petty bourgeoisie always works against us doing that, even if, especially elected African petty bourgeoisie, those in power. So it's, uh, I know uh, I've probably gone too long on that comment, uh, Akile. But who to come in live? Thank you for that question, though. Uhuru, thank you, Life, for your question. And thank you, Chairman. Um, we have just one more question come in, and I don't know, maybe if you could take this just really quickly, but uh, Comrade Demetria has another question. Oh, Lord, we have more questions. Okay. Well, let's just see if we can squeeze this one in. Um, Demetria asks, can you speak on Malcolm X's daughter's passing and the CIA? More question. Well, uh, I think implicit in the, in the question is, did the CIA kill Malcolm X's daughter? And uh, I, you know, I, I can't say that. I think it's appropriate to be suspicious of everything like that. And you talk of a person that uh, was such, such an icon and continues to be about revolutionary movement that anything surrounding um, uh, bad things happening to him, uh, to his family, et cetera, uh, is something that we have to be suspicious of. And uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, would, I would say that. I, I think that, um, so that's more or less where I would I would put it, and I, yeah, I leave it there, uh, Sister Demetria. Uh, yeah, I leave it there. I think it's appropriate to be suspicious, but I I don't know if they would have had anything to do with that. I think that Malcolm X's children, family, uh, uh, place horrible uh, consequences as a, uh, a resulting uh, from uh, the CIA and other uh, intelligence organizations who uh, really recognize what a force he was in the struggle for our liberation and that his whole family uh, has paid a price for it and that they continue to pay a price for it, even if it's indirectly uh, uh, as a consequence of, of what happened to Malcolm himself. Uhuru, thank you, Demetria, and thank you, Chairman. The assault made on Malcolm X's daughter was the one that was made on Malcolm X. Yeah. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. So um, again, thank you, Demetria, for your question. And um, yeah, we're going to go ahead and start wrapping up. But I do want to appreciate everybody who submitted questions this time. And for those that remain outstanding, we will take them in the next Sunday study. But Chairman, I just want to turn it over to you for closing remarks before we close the show. Well, I want to thank you, uh, uh, Comrade uh, Director, um, and everybody who uh, was able uh, to participate uh, in this study, and that they are in incredibly important, especially right now. Uh, when uh, this system is staggering, it's definitely staggering, and it's in trouble. And uh, that trouble reveals itself in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways uh, was inferred uh, during this discussion about how white people are acting now, uh, acting uh, with assassinations and murder, 
uh, uh, sometimes in broad daylight, like what happened with Armin Bar uh, Arbery, um, uh, most times in broad, recently in broad daylight, uh, how, uh, you know, the, the attempt by a sector of the ruling class, a uh, sector of the white population to overthrow the government, uh, that's real. And, uh, and uh, the fact is that how vulnerable African people are who uh, are relying on anti-racist uh, uh, and uh, uh, black liberals and white liberals, uh, the Democratic Party and these other institutions uh, uh, to uh, protect us, uh, the institutions created by uh, the colonizer uh, himself to protect us. And why it's so important uh, right now for us to, uh, to build the African People's Socialist Party, to build the African Socialist International, uh, to be organized uh, so that uh, we're not uh, in a reflexive mode all the time, but we are always uh, on the offensive. And so uh, that's what uh, our work provides us with this ability to do. So uh, also I wanna remind everybody again in February, uh, we are going to be having the uh, third plenary of our seventh Congress and people should be doing everything you can to get ready for that, to come to that. And with that, uh, Comrade Director, I just want to appreciate you and tell people that you should get this issue of the Burning Spear. Uh, this is an extraordinary uh, publication, always has been, but it's a great paper that's come out this issue. Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, Chairman. And you can do that at burningsquaremarketplace.com and register for the plenary at APSPplenary.org. Again, just want to salute you, Chairman, the leadership um, that you've provided over you know, these over 50 years to the Afro liberation struggle and the development of African internationalism. And I want to also thank all of you for tuning in. And I just want to uh, encourage you to like and subscribe to the Burning Spirit TV channel on YouTube to catch every episode of the Omali Tommy Sunday study and continue to support OTM by donating to paypal.me slash Omali taught me. And we will catch you guys next Sunday. Vanguard up.